Well, folks, it's that time again. It's time for another TriMet Sock Puppet meeting. Yes, I'm starting to look forward to these again because I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I just I just like watching the two sides of TriMet. I spent quite a bit of time monitoring the dispatch. You know, the real TriMet, real people, real problems, and I've been uh, watching these. Sock puppet meetings, this is also known as the TriMet aristocracy. The aristocracy is what I consider to be the economic parasites of the TriMet system. Now, I'm not trying to just pick on TriMet. This is standard throughout the industry. Every district has their parasites, and every tax farm has their parasites. Wherever you see tax-funded programs, you see a parasite class of people who make big money and uh, don't actually do anything for the citizens. But this is America today, over-bureaucratized, heavily police-stated. Interestingly, America has become the Soviet Union. And you know, those of you who don't remember, the Soviet Union had this huge bureaucracy and nobody was doing the work, but they sure had a lot of people running things, you know, a lot of managers, coordinators, directors, etc. And nobody was actually doing anything, but... And they were also a heavily... They were a big-time police state, which is what this country has turned into. And it wasn't long after all of that was put into place that the whole Soviet Union fell apart. And I think you know, the United States is getting close to economic Armageddon... And uh, it's unfortunate, but apparently these things run in cycles. Human behavior is always predictable. And people are greedy, and people are power hungry. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with the Sock Puppets meeting. Okay? The Sock Puppets meeting is a cheerleading session, you know, a heavily scripted session, for those of you who don't know, who haven't seen it before, where all these aristocrats get together and pat themselves on the back and the board of directors, who I fondly call sock puppets, all cheer. It reminds me of the high school cheerleading. Remember when you were in school, they had uh, cheer. Uh, they had what do they call it? Uh, it? Wasn't cheerleading. It was oh pep rally, pep rally. Everybody would went down to the auditorium, and they <laughs> did a bunch of cheers for your school. That's what that's what this reminds me of because everybody everybody says how great everything is and how wonderful they're doing, and the sock puppets all nod their heads approvingly. It's all big farce, it's all big show, but nevertheless, these are the people that run everything. So you need to watch it and hear what they're up to. You know, they're completely disconnected from reality. They're technocrats, bureaucrats. They really have no idea about the reality of a transit system. These uh, technocrats are in the process of handing out huge amounts of money for the Capital Projects Cabal, also known as the Portland Light Rail Mafia. That's where the real money is in TriMet. Of course, they don't talk about it. Uh, you might notice that TriMet makes no effort whatsoever to inform their public that these meetings are going on. And that should make you understand that they don't want people to know. And uh, they don't. They've been operating this stuff secretly for years. And they still basically are. And there's a subculture of people like myself that watch this stuff. But it's a very small segment of the population. Most of the Portland area population is completely unaware of any of this. All right. Without any further ado, let's see what's on store for the sock puppets. Oh, yeah. One more comment. The entire uh, public testimony section was blanked out. There was no audio. This is the second time that's happened. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if it's intentional. Last time they put the audio up later, but uh, how can you do the same exact error? Only during the public testimony, interestingly. They don't have the sound, you know. Yeah, I know they're incompetent fools, but sometimes I have to think, well, they just don't want people to know what's going on. Uh, and uh, they, they don't want you to know. And that's one of the reasons why they <laughs> do all of this. And who knows? Anyway, let's get right to what we can hear.
chairmanship of the CAT, they uh, voted in uh, Jan Campbell. She's going to continue in that role for one more term. Uh, Dan Bauer, uh, the executive director of the Portland Streetcar, uh, attended and answered a number of questions and talked about, in particular, challenges around uh, malfunctioning um, bridge plates on the streetcars and some of their changes in policy and operating streetcars where those bridge plates are not functioning. Uh, Alan Lado uh, spoke about the um, fiscal year 2018 business plan and received some feedback from CAT members on that. And then finally there were lift reports. Eileen Collins gave a report on uh, lift performance in the months of May and June. Damon Blocker reported on the cycle of a, life, of a lift trip and uh, Eileen uh, Collins, in addition, solicited participation of the CAT committee in an upcoming emergency preparedness drill. And that's the report. That's Thank a you. very succinct report. Thank you. I, I did will point out that whoever did the minutes this, this month for your, uh, your committee really outdid themselves in terms <laughs> really of Really a lot of detail. There was a lot of detail yeah. there, but it was interesting yeah. to read. So we probably won't see that every month, but thank you for the, mm -hmm. for the uh, uh, shorter report. Any questions of, uh, for the director? All right, then let's move on to the Metro Policy Advisory Committee, uh, MPAC, uh, Director Prosser. Yeah. These reports aren't very interesting. These are supposedly the uh, the directors that attend these various uh, ancillary meetings around the area, and there never, there's never much to talk about here, so I'm not going to talk about it. At the last meeting of, of MPAC, uh, we had a briefing on um, Metro's uh, work updating the, the regional transit plan. That is a, a, a project that's been ongoing for um, several months now and uh, will be finished up. It'll, we're about third to a half of the way, way through the, the um, project. Um, primarily it involves updating the existing regional transit plan to reflect uh, current projects um, either in process or, or on, on the drawing boards, um, removing some that are no longer going forward such as the Lake Oswego trolley. Um, and then also to uh, reflect um, current plans um, with um, climate smart communities, um, that type of thing. Um, the impact did discuss um, you know, various aspects of that. One of the items that came up, and Randy had mentioned how last mile is, is of growing importance in the Beaverton area, that is a concern throughout the region. and. Uh, MPAC did suggest that uh, Metro take a look at the regional transit plan in terms of last mile and, and what the plan can do to encourage uh, actions to improve uh, access to existing lines. Um, the board, our board, will be uh, receiving a briefing next month, as I understand it, from our staff in greater detail. So I think, you know, that will give you a pretty good idea of, of what's going on there. Um, we also had a briefing on, on uh, Metro's efforts to update the uh, regional solid waste management plan um, of limited interest to us, but there they are, working away. So um, that's all. Thank you. Good report. Any questions of Director Prosser? All right, seeing none, then I'm going to move right on to the general manager's uh, report. Mr. General Manager. Mr. Board President, members of the board, and everyone here, um, uh, I wanted to just pass on my greetings to all of our West Side uh, colleagues and friends. Um, I do see Commissioner, did see Commissioner Malinowski here, uh, as well as uh, uh, obviously Pam Trees from the West Side Economic Alliance, and a number of other uh, important, Luann Pelton, who was a uh, a long-time uh, member of our Budget Advisory Committee during some very difficult times. So we have a lot of friends here and a lot of uh, colleagues and supporters and I'm pleased to see them here. So thank you again to the City of Beaverton and everyone on the West Side for hosting us here today. Um, and I, I wanted to also just, I know Mayor Dora couldn't be here, but I would just tell you there's no greater champion for uh, TriMet uh, and the work that we do than Mayor Doyle. Um, just a very brief report saw him last Thursday at the JPAC meeting and he was actually 
uh, extolling the virtues of the Low Income Fair Program and Task Force with Pam and he and many other. Extolling the virtues of Low Income Fair that's not going to be happening until 2019 sometime, which means it's not happening. So why are you talking about it until it's happening? You know, the comment I want to make about that is, is if uh, this was a capital project, they would be putting a bond out right now for the uh, low-income fair and, and starting it immediately. But since it's not a capital project, they're not going to put it out until TriMet has the, the money in hand. And that's uh, another example of how uh, public transportation doesn't really serve the public. You know, a capital project, no problem, we put the bonds out today. Low income fair, sorry, we have to wait for some money. Uh, representatives from the West Side, obviously, a board president served on, and uh, you know, what a great program that is. He's beginning to talk it up at a national level as a great solution to some of the equity issues that our region faces. So, again, um, a, a real champion here in the city of Beaverton for what we do. I'm very pleased to be working with him and partnering with him on many, many things. I um, wanted to start my report with ridership. Uh, when we compare June of this year with last year, we were down in ridership a little less than 1%. Most of that has, can translate back to reduced ridership on the MAC system during the, the two um, Rose Festival parades. Ridership on, and, and attendance at the parades were down this year compared to previous years. Uh, so we do see some, so a, a trend associated with that. Uh, when we do look a little closer at the numbers, we see that bus ridership was basically flat. The peak hour for bus ridership was up just very slightly. But again, max was down a bit, 2.3 uh, for weekly ridership numbers on average, uh, as was Wes. And again, I think a lot of that had to do with parade attendance and ridership. Right. Well, as usual, it's always some external reason why things, why the ridership goes down. It's not because the service is so unreliable that people don't really want to ride. We, you couldn't say that, right? Is that people really don't want to ride it because it's not reliable. And uh, of course, he's never going to say that. He's going to say, well, we had to do this work. And I mean, why would West ridership be down? I mean, it has nothing to do with anything. But West is a miserable failure, which is sucking down multi millions of dollars that could be used to fund services that people actually do need. But that was a capital project, so that means they could take that money and stick it in all of their favorite contractors' pockets, and that's the whole purpose of government. Um, and I just wanted to uh, uh, elaborate just a little bit more on the ridership. Uh, we'll be bringing to you a much more thorough report of our sort of studies over the last year about ridership and the trends and what is affecting ridership. And I think I'll, I'll just shortcut it a little bit to say that there is not one thing that is affecting ridership. You know, there's uh, fairly interesting and, and perhaps even dramatic uh, demographic changes. There's changes in the workforce. There's changes in people's perceptions. There's lots of, um, lots of other uh, issues, including how our service meets the needs of individuals. And you heard David and others speak to that. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. So there's a, there's a number of different factors that come into play, uh, which of course makes it a comprehensive problem to solve, not one where there is an easy fix in any uh, and one in terms of reversing those trends. Uh, but I'm convinced that, that we uh, we can identify those and share those with you, and that as we look toward future investments, we can begin to aim uh, a certain portion of those uh, to ridership uh, 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 service and growth. Um, just another sort of telling statistics that tells us the job that we have at hand is that for the fifth straight year in 2016, the Federal uh, Highway Administration reported another increase in vehicle miles traveled in the region. So that's sort of reversing some trends we saw from earlier in this decade. Um, and this, you should know, is also very much a, um, a national phenomenon. There are a lot of properties that, frankly, would love to see ridership down 1% because they're in double digits in terms of the reductions. So um, I think. Okay, he's not lying about the national uh, statistical decrease in transit ridership. It is down. And as somebody who watches this stuff daily, my I think it's pretty simple to figure out why it's down because public transportation's a failure. Who's going to take it 
if you never know how long it's going to take you to get home. Who's going to take public transportation if a bus won't stop for you because it's too full? Who's going to take public transportation if every goddamn day Max is disrupted? Nobody's going to take it, and he can have all the explanations he wants. But we, the, the, those of us that study this material, know the truth. And it's, it's not the external factors. It's the fact that the system is not that great. We have to be uh, key. I also will uh, transition here shortly to report on the launch of the HOP FastPass system, but have obviously some hope that with easier payment mechanisms that fit the lifestyle of today's riders that we can actually, um, we can actually uh, reverse uh, some of those trends and really make it easy to ride. Um, re regarding... Uh now right there is a very good example of how disconnected he, he really is. Fit the quote, fit the lifestyle of people who ride transit. <laughs> fit the lifestyle of people. The hot card is going gonna, is gonna to fit the lifestyle. That is the most ridiculous statement. <laughs> okay, that doesn't make any sense. And people don't give it. You have a, you have a cell phone app, which doesn't work half the time. And you have cash fare. This is, this is a luxury that wasn't really needed. Although I know every transit system has them. So that means... Trima has to have them too because every other transit system has them and they all do the same thing. They all follow each other around with their little projects. But uh, the, the dependent riders, you know, don't have any use for this. And it's a hassle. This is going to be a hassle because you have, it's not that easy to reload. Uh, you have to go to a store or something or online. It's, you can't do it on a machine. I'm not sure how that's going to play out, but... Uh, Saying that it's going to fit the lifestyle of the transit riders is bullshit.